Um, thank you so much for being here. I thank both of uh, those that have joined us in the room as well as those that are uh, joining us on Zoom. I hope that you can hear us well and see us well uh, online. Uh, my name is Tim Lindgren. I'm a doctor, uh, postdoctoral research fellow here at Amsterdam Law School under the SCALE project, as well as Amsterdam Center for International Law. And it's a great pleasure for me to introduce uh, our speaker today, Dr. Kathleen uh, Birrell from La Trobe University, all the way from Australia, uh, Melbourne, who will be delivering the SCALE lecture uh, today. So Kathleen is perhaps, uh, in many ways, one of the leading scholars amongst those such as Margaret Davis, uh, um, Mann, and uh, Emily Jones, on what we can broadly capture as uh, new materialist and post-human approaches to law. And when it comes to Kathleen's work, perhaps specifically matter of law and life in the time of the Anthropocene. Um, so Kathleen has published widely on matters on the Anthropocene, as well as also the rights of nature. Um, and your research uh, that those critical legal methodologies to interrogate precisely this relationship between law and ecology, as well as the broader uh, tradition of law and humanities uh, and the colonial theory, as well as praxis, which is something that I know several people in the room here are interested in, so we can pick up some of, of those themes. Um, and we talked about this yesterday, but I think one of the perhaps most striking features of your work that I really appreciate is your ability to uh, sometimes refuse to pin law to the nation state, but rather pay attention to law as something that operates across multiple different registers uh, and also across multiple legal orders. Uh, which is a very prominent feature in Australia when indigenous legal orders are present. Um, so with that said, uh, I uh, will pass it over to you. But before I do that, uh, I also just want to thank SCALE, of course, for supporting this seminar and hosting Kathleen, uh, Ivana in particular, as well as Ingo uh, and Lucia for uh, all the support in putting on the event. Uh, and then just a final quick note in terms of the structure that we're going to follow. So Kathleen will speak for perhaps 30, 40 minutes or something of that sort. Uh, and then instead of offering commentary on the paper, I will offer two perhaps more substantive questions that ties together with some of the themes that we have discussed on the scale this year. Um, and then after that, we'll open for a broader conversation uh, based on, on those questions or other themes that... Uh, anyone wants to explore. So if you're online and want to ask a question or make a comment, perhaps just raise your hand and we'll uh, try to catch you that way and ask you to unmute and ask your question. Uh, if your microphone is not working for some reason, you can of course also write the question in the chat, uh, but ideally we would have you uh, ask the question in person uh, or through the microphone. So with that uh, further ado, I will turn it over to Kathleen, thank you. Thank you so much, Tim, and thank you everybody for uh, inviting me to share my work uh, with you all. It's a real privilege to be able to workshop my current ideas in writing and to benefit from all of your expertise and insights and conversation. So thank you very much for your hospitality. Um, before I begin, I would like to... Um, uh, offer an acknowledgement um, of country, which is an, an important part of scholarly practice and conduct in Australia, um, to pay my respects to the custodians of the unceded lands and waters on and alongside which I live and work in Nam, uh, well, Melbourne, um, and just the Wurundjeri Woiwurrung peoples of the Kulin Nation, and I acknowledge Wurundjeri elders as keepers of law and country. I'd like to particularly give this acknowledgement because a significant part of my work is concerned with developing an ethics of encounter that is appropriate to this acknowledgement and its attendant responsibilities. And so I hope that it can inform part of our conversation. My presentation today is part of a larger project which explores the historical legacies of legal representations and imaginaries that organize contemporary concepts in the Western legal tradition and the ways that these perpetuate ecological, ecological degradation and injustice. 
The key aim in my work is to orientate legal theorization toward an acknowledgement of the materiality of emergent subjectivities, normativities, and laws. And here I draw on the work of Margaret Davies. And in so doing, to develop a relational idea of ecologies of obligation, or what I would like to call lawful ecologies, which foreground an ethics of obligation that offers possibilities for legal intervention in the context of planetary crisis. As you mentioned, the intellectual impetus and anchor for this work and its iterations over time has been the Anthropocene thesis. That is a controversial proposition that the present moment is part of a new geological epoch prompted by the practices and excesses of human consumption, production, and habitation. And as many of you are no doubt aware, on the 5th of March of this year, the Subcommission on Quaternary Stratigraphy announced that the Anthropocene is not accepted as a formal unit of the geologic timescale. Following the initial coining of this term by Paul Crutzen and Eugene Stormer, the Anthropocene Working Group took almost 15 years to conclude that the Anthropocene merited consideration at all as a geologic, uh, formal geological unit. And the decision to exclude it from this timescale principally turned upon the duration of the proposed epoch, which in their reckoning might be more properly considered an event rather than an epoch. So this decision <laughs> and the voluminous literature that precedes it reflect, I think, a critical merging of scientific and humanist discourses which has important implications for my exploration of the ethics of obligation in these changing times. Alexander Damianos has recently offered a interesting reflection on the rejection of the thesis, suggesting that the decision foregrounds the role of the commission not as an arbiter of the veracity of scientific finding, but rather as an administrator of geological time and space. So a geology is not mere observation, but a political and legal technique to the extent that it is both retrospective and anticipatory. For Catherine Yusof, the Anthropocene references an anticipatory geologic moment, that is what we are ceasing to be. Ge geologists are called to adjudicate uh, what we will have become with reference to what we have been. And this temporal tension, I think, is foregrounded in the decision which nuances rather than excludes anthropocenic thought from scholarly theorization. So that is my point of departure. So in this paper, I draw on this significant body of work to explore manifestations of this relational idea in sites of ecological restoration, uh, which are directed toward reciprocity and repair and start sites of restoring or restoring in the recovery and resurgence of cultural attachments to and responsibilities for the inhuman. And these sites reveal and describe extant, emplaced and embodied dependencies, emerging not from the congealed form of rights and duties, but from the material and discursive flows of obligation. And I approach this task by taking up and extending the analytic of the inhumanities, a methodology to which I will return, to develop an apprehension of thought as a material practice and of legal meaning as contingent, but also embodied and emplaced. Oops. Can't make that work. Oops. Oh, well, there we go. That's fine. <laughs> well, <at all. laughs> so in short, I'm concerned with how to do critical jurisprudence in a planetary age or how to understand law as grounded in emergent materialities where good post-structuralists know that the metaphysical grounds of law are far from secure and necessarily indeterminate. The current iteration of my project can be schematized in four steps, which I've set out there on the slide, and we can expand these in conversation. The first of these is legal apparatus, subject, and scale. And by that, I mean the legal imaginaries and representations of subjectivity and objectivity, which are enmeshed within the enclosures of a humanist ontology 
and made explicit in the Register of Rights, here understood as a legal apparatus. The second is plural nomos, supplement and force. That is the plural nomos from which law emerges and by which it is supplemented and generates force in normative patterns and configurations. And I'll unpack that a bit more in a moment. The third in human socialities, obligations and ethics, that is how to understand the relationships and bonds that constitute and differentiate configurations of matter with which law is continuous. And finally, lawful ecologies, techniques, and techne, that is the methods and conduct by which obligations are negotiated and composed here drawing on Latour, which are enlivened by an effective orientation toward the ecological communities of which we are all a part. So today I'll take up just a small part of this project, sketching my experimental methodology and briefly outlining its application to the development of an idea of local ecologies. The conventional relationship between law and matter in the Western tradition has been explored at some length, yielding, amongst other things, the observation that law is concerned with how matter assumes legal meaning. While law is materialized through inscription and speech, its foundational elements turn upon fiction and abstraction. The attribution of legal meaning to space, time and matter is understood to be limited to questions of fact. Contemporary legal representations and imaginaries organized by the intellectual inheritances of Cartesian dualism, Newtonian physics and Kantian subjectivity reinscribe this conventional relationship between law and matter. Intractable distinctions between subject and object, life and non-life, lively and inert, emerge from a neglect of the subtending materiality of life and are weaponized in the extractivism of empire and the ancestral catastrophe of late liberalism. And this neglect defines and delimits the conceptual building blocks of, of legal theorization and praxis and subjectivity and normativity which constitute and render legible, dominant legal technologies, techniques, and institutions. But experimental thinking between law and the inhuman signals a decentering of humanism while also foregrounding its endemic violence. It reveals the contingency of law's ontological commitments and the processes of inclusion and exclusion by which presumptive boundaries and binaries emerge. So thinking beyond these commitments, including beyond the extension of an abstracted legal subjectivity and attendant rights to non-human others, such as occurs in rights for nature, earth jurisprudence, ecological jurisprudence, I think entails a reconfiguring of the world in an attitude of questioning that goes all the way down. The idea of the human as distinct from its inhuman others is challenged in multiple registers, prompting an exploration of the emergence and co-constitution of human and inhuman legalities. Scholarly interventions animated by this intellectual turn explore and embrace the mutuality of human and non-human emergence. And this renewed disruption of the binaries of modernity prompts a consideration of how law is constituted, reconstituted and anticipated by inhuman socialities and normativities. And this, uh, this uh, scholarship has coalesced in the idea of the inhumanities, uh, lately taken up by Katrin Yusov, a disruptive analytic that reflects a broader concern with the nature and limits of the humanities as a form of knowledge in our contemporary context. The humanities are conventionally conceived as the modes of understanding that privilege the human, defining contradistinction to the inhuman. And this ontological privilege is made manifest in the apparatuses, technologies, and techniques of Western law. In contrast to this, the inhumanities draws upon and extends the geophilosophy of Elizabeth Cross in an exploration of what she describes as the role of the inhuman in the humanities. And this rendering of geophilosophy emerges from scholarly engagements with the relationship between human and inhuman forces. And this includes the work of Nietzsche, Spinoza, and Bergson in the uh, particular tradition, 
who in turn influenced Deleuze to explore the ontological assumptions of epistemology and to acknowledge the shared life of subject and object. Deleuze and Guattari assert, in truth, there are only inhumanities. Humans are made exclusively of inhumanities, but very different ones, of very different natures and speeds. Reconfigurations of the humanities are now directed toward a reckoning with normative ontological distinctions between subjectivity and matter and the extractivist economies that entrench this binary. And this re reckoning is reflected in new materialist scholarship in its diverse forms, which dwells upon the agency and liveliness of the inhuman. My project takes up the inhumanities and its geophilosophy in an effort to ground law in a planetary age. Planetarity, understood by Spivak, differs from the geopolitics of knowledge and the cosmopolitics of stewardship, here drawing upon Stengers and Mignolo. Rather, Spivak is focused on the untranslatable experience of planetary creatures, including the human, where planetarity describes a relational ethics that issues globalization and embraces the heterogeneity of uncollapsible difference. And this notion departs from the determinacy and conventions of social norms and legal forms, including the singularity of subjectivity and right, to acknowledge the expansive ethics that subtend planetary coexistence. Rather than extending extant legal frames and regimes for the protection and governance of rights, I'm concerned with how determinate law might be understood as a meeting place for lawful ecologies, that is, a meeting place for the indeterminate human and inhuman scales, subjectivities, socialities, and techniques that ground lawful relations. This analysis adopts a methodology drawn from the philosophy physics of Karen Barad, who urges an acknowledgement of the materiality of theory as an embodied and emplaced practice, refuting the pretense of metaphysical exteriority and detachment. So just as Varad writes of the radicality of meeting the universe halfway, we might imagine lawful ecologies as the meeting of human and inhuman legalities where each exceeds the other in the direction of the other. And this is applied to the inhumanities as an experimental analytic with which to reimagine the ontological limits of the proprietorial rights-bearing legal subject. So I'd now like to turn to um, engage with Karen, Karen Barad's work a bit more deeply. Thought experiments, Barad writes, are material matters. Thinking is emplaced and embodied, an experimentation not confined to humans in exteriority, but constituted in relationship with the, with the non-human. Theories and theorizing as a form of experimentation can be understood as living and breathing reconfigurings of the world and are not limited to animate life forms. So for Barad, this figuring and reconfiguring doesn't follow a predetermined algorithm, but is instead exemplified in touch, the touch of entangled beings coming, becoming together apart. And this rendering of touch differs from the explanations of classical physics in which the experience of touch is illusory. So the apparent contact between skin and surface is merely the electromagnetic repulsion of electrons between fingers and objects according to the conventional theory in physics. But for Barad, quantum field theory deconstructs and queers this ontology, revealing the constitutive entanglement of particles to the extent that all touching entails an infinite alterity and all material entities are entangled relations of becoming. The quantum physics of touch disrupts the linearity of causality, prompting us to acknowledge and account for the iterability of matter. Similarly, for Margaret Davies, drawing upon rearticulations of Lucretius in the work of Michelle Serres and others, the material flows that generate and perpetuate normativities are not linear, but turbulent. The material processes of normative becoming are defined by convergence and divergence, Generating, generating the disorder from which order emerges. So in this way, thinking as a material matter emerges from the incalculability and the indeterminacy of material forms and flows, touch and turbulence. 
And for Virad, these encounters entail a responsibility and responsiveness, both to and as a part of the world's patternings and memories. I'm particularly concerned with how a notion of thinking as a material matter, that is human thought as continuous with inhuman forms and flows, might provide a methodology with which to grapple with and account for the intellectual legacies of modern thought. And in so doing, I'm prompted to heed Davies' exhortation to suspend the idea or ideal of theory as primarily conceptual and instead to commit to its practice as an embodied and material project. In the context uh, that we live in of existential threat and planetary ruin, it is indeed perplexing that legal scholarship and practice directed toward arresting ecological degradation have largely focused on the perpetuation and expansion of normative legal regimes and doctrines grounded in rights. These doctrines remain apparently unmoved by this intellectual turn persisting in a continued attachment to an abstracted yet resolutely human legal subjectivity and attendant rights, which fail to address their manifest inadequacies and limitation. So rather than merely adding to well-established critique in this vein, I'm interested in the emplacement and embodiment of this thinking as a material matter. The idea of the human as distinct from its inhuman others is challenged by the revelation of a community of bodies within which the human is enmeshed, continuous with the mineralogical substrate inhabited by microbial symbionts. Thinking and experimenting with Barad, I find myself enfolded in fleshy relationships of dependence and need. Legal imaginaries and representations of subjectivity in the Western tradition, which are enmeshed within the humanist ontology and made explicit in the legal register of rights, are challenged by the revelation of a plural nomos and its patterns of relationality and obligation. That is, whereas law is understood to create a normative universe, in the words of Robert Cover, this experiment will brought foregrounds a normative universe of material processes from which human legalities as both form and meaning emerge and by which law generates force. A reimagining of the human then in the capaciousness of nature culture necessitates a confrontation with the fictions and abstractions of law epitomised in the deployment of the human as a legal apparatus. Principal among these abstractions is the ontologically prior subject, grounded in Cartesian dualism. The human subject is de deployed as discursive legal apparatus rather than an embodied and emergent microbiome. And this abstracted human constitutes and renders legible the rights-bearing legal subject, a technology or convenient device that enables legal relations and in turn drives the institutional and regulatory machinery of global order. Working with Barad's performative approach to the representationalist trap of geometrical op optics, I'll briefly take this apparatus apart. The strict determinism by which nature and culture are split and objectivity is secured is grounded in the relentless linearity of the Newtonian mechanical universe. In Barad's words, effects follow their causes end on end, and each particle takes its preordained place with each tick of the clock. In this universe, the discursive positioning of an apparatus as a mere instrument of measurement is affected by the Cartesian cut between observable object and wielding subject. And this Euclidean geometry is exemplified in the conventional calibration of the inhuman to the human as of object to subject which is central to the humanist presumptions of law. But for Barad, an apparatus is neither objective nor neutral, that is mechanical, but iterative, constituted through practices that remain open to rearrangements, rearticulations and reworkings. Whereas humanist accounts describe apparatuses as static assemblages, they can instead in Barad's account be understood as open-ended practices. Barad draws upon and extends the philosophy physics of Niels Bohr in an acknowledgement of the limitations of representationalism and its presumptive distinction between objects of representation 
of investigation and their representation, and an elaboration of a diffractive methodological approach to understanding the mutuality of different conceptions of the human and the non-human, the material and the discursive, the natural and the cultural, and so on. Uh, Barad presents an unconventional account of Bohr's work and argues that Bohr is engaged in a questioning of the Western metaphysics of individualism, disrupting the fantasy of individual things and properties and the concomitant binary between interior and exterior, autonomy and determinism. And this questioning has clear implications for the distillation of the relationship between law and matter in the liberal rights-bearing individual upon which modern law turns. Taking up Barad's methodology, we might begin to perceive the diffractive possibilities of the inhumanities for legal imaginaries in the acknowledgement of the inhuman as supplement and force subtending the human and of the ethics of responsibility to this stranger within in uh, juridian terms. Staying with Barad then, who stays with the trouble of ethical responsibility and hospitality invoked by Levinas and Derrida, we're prompted to consider the presence of an inhuman supplement and the obligations attending the entanglement belatedly acknowledged in our times. The inhuman that inheres within the human is a constitutive supplement that adds only to replace. The slippage between supplement and supplant namely an addition and a replacement, constitutes the origin, substance and force of law, not as transcendent, but imminent. Where every individual already includes in its very composition the unfathomable, unfathomable magnitude of all others, the self is defined by the stranger at home. Returning to the quantum physics of touch, which entails an enfolding or involution of the self to touch the stranger within, Barad describes the ontological indeterminacy and radical openness at the core of mattering. So to acknowledge the inhuman within the human, questions of right and obligation must be understood to not merely reflect the self in an economy of the same, but to turn on the performativity of the relationships and dependencies from which subjects and objects emerge in a process of interaction. <laughs> this performative account, which Brooklyn calls a genteel realism, prompts an apprehension of the contingency of subject-object binaries. Instead, agency is cut loose from its traditional humanist orbit, in the right words. While the possibilities attending interactions don't wholly preclude the exercise of intention, they're co-constitutive rather than um, autonomous, dynamic rather than congealed. For Barad, ethical obligation attends interaction. Each of us is constituted in responsibility, as responsible for the other as the other. The key here is the positioning of self or subject not as a singular and responsible entity, but as responsive to the continued becoming by which we are constituted. So reading now Barad with Gross, this revelation prompts an ethical obligation, which could be described as an affective orientation toward the inhuman, where obligation is construed not as a mode of biopolitical discipline, but instead as a sensory attunement to our earthly attachments. That is, the inhuman is rendered in terms of its resistance to objectification rather than as the object of biopolitical regulation and attendant obligations. Taking this resistance seriously, Gross ponders what it might mean to issue writing for and of objects in favour of writing with or between them. If we accept the diminishing distinction between objects and subjects prompted by the inhuman turn, this task extends to reading, listening and conversing with the inhuman without reverting to a reductionist anthropomorphism. In giving form to an affective orientation toward the geologic, we might reflect upon the legal techniques by which the inhuman is written and heard and by which the dialogic reciprocity of conversation might unfold. This dialogue need not be even or equivalent in space or time. Indeed, these distinctions no longer hold in Barad's reading of the individual as always already threaded through with an infinite alterity diffracted through being and time. 
Rather, obligation, as I understand this, is the debt accrued in becoming, where even the smallest bits of matter are an unfathomable multitude. Conversing with the inhuman as legal technique and techne might be understood as the method and conduct by which reciprocal obligations are negotiated and composed as lawful ecologies. So now to come to this uh, term, lawful ecologies, perhaps better read as lawful, is a reference to places as already replete with imminent and emergent legal meaning, rather than as mere repositories for the imposition of a singular extrinsic law, such as state law. Lawful ecologies, therefore, offers an idea of legal normativities as emergent from and regulatory of material flows and exchanges configured as ecologies. Matter and materiality can be understood as relational configurations of energy, that is solid, fluid, transparent, opaque, but also as the attribution of meaning. And it's the attribution of meaning to matter that transforms the flow of matter into the form of materiality. But again, this is provisional, just as the determinacy of law turns on indeterminacy. It stasis only ever for the time being. An understanding of law as flow rather than stasis prompts a defiance of definition. While ontological conformity to determinacy requires delimitation, matter and materiality defy determinacy. So returning to Barad, matter can't be defined as the particles that take their place in the world as separate entities, but rather by their material continuity. If the continuity between human and inhuman is material, if it matters, the determinacy of form and force is better expressed as becoming, that is, form is flow. So in this way, the mineral is a condition of life, that is, precedes life, but also constitutes life and therefore exceeds life. The life of the mineral, as described by Gross, can be understood as a reference to the flow of matter in and as living forms, which may repeat in a familiar pathway, but is not determined by it. So in short, continuity as flow both precedes and exceeds discontinuity as form. And this returns us to my principal concern, the grounding of legal meaning in emergent materialities and the contingency of form which emerges from flow. Obligations as continuous relation or bond both precede and exceed rights, where the rights form and conventional renderings of law more generally might be understood as a reduction or a cross-section of material processes. The legal subject as form and force is meaningful, material, not in stasis, but in the becoming of matter as flow. And reading with Davies, this idea might be more succinctly expressed as law in and as nature. This formulation is exemplified in the institutional and epistemic plurality of ecological restoration an emergent tool with which to expand rather than contract the ontological limits of subjectivity and attendant obligations. Restoration is a process of human engagement with and deference to inhuman normativities, organised by an apprehension of the ecosociality of non-human species and communities. The process is here understood not in terms of the presumptive linearity and mechanisation of causation, typified in technological restoration, in which ecosystems are atomized and quantified, uh, such as occurs in carbon offsetting and sequestration, for example. Rather, the focus is on practices of reciprocal restoration and repair, which acknowledge the plurality of normative values and functions, as well as dependencies and obligations. The reciprocity of restoration is also evident in the resurgence of human in human relationships in First Nations legal orders, to which I alluded earlier. Metis scholar Zoe Todd is involved in a shared project of restoring or restoring fish futures in Canada, explicitly honouring Indigenous legal ethical relations. The artwork on the slide here is entitled Going Home, created by Todd for this project, Fresh Water Fish Futures. Drawing on Métis philosophy and legal tradition in an engagement with human and fish relations and fish philosophy, Todd and co-author Anja Kangisa argue that thinking with and from place 
requires an attentiveness and sensory attunement which recognises ontoepistemologies as co-constitutive and acknowledges the importance of labouring with and in place through lasting reciprocal relationships. And this attunement is described as an ethics of accountability, both to the places we inhabit, as well as our conduct in those places. Following the legal techniques of reciprocal, reciprocal relationality illuminated in these projects and practices within the broader analytic of the inhumanities, we might begin to account, uh, acknowledge and account for the plurality of local ecologies. The obligations contemplated here are not institutionalised and codified as the corollary to rights, but the reciprocal claims that bind us in ecological community. These bonds might be more simply expressed as relationships of dependence. In this way, obligation marks the halfway point of interaction. The meeting is not an encounter, but an acknowledgement of the entangled relations of being, of becoming, or the stranger within which is what makes matter material. An apprehension of plurality as lawful or lawful ecologies foregrounds an ethics of obligation in an expanded nomos. Thank you.